close to 40% of them will have one, just under 20% will have two, um, like 7% will have three, and then the number with four, five, six gets very, very small. So this is a famous distribution, and it's called a, anybody know what the name of this is? Anybody heard of the Poisson distribution? So in the Poisson distribution, you have a single parameter, and that parameter is the number, the average number of balls per box, and the distribution will tell you how many balls there are per box. And so if we go back to the Poisson distribution, over here, you can see these are the values that have been drawn for different values of lambda. And the mathematics of the Poisson distribution is given in terms of your, uh, your probability, or um, this is your probability moment function. Uh, so you wouldn't have seen these functions unless uh, you, you looked at elementary discrete distributions in statistics. Has anybody done a course where you looked at that? Okay. So what's important here is the idea that you can calculate uh, the, the mean and the variance. The mean of this distribution is lambda. Its variance is also lambda. And there's a formula over here that says what's the probability that a box has k balls in it. And it's given by lambda to the k, e to the minus lambda over k factorial. So if you remember the factorial function, k factorial is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times all the way up to k. So this allows you to calculate all these different heights over here. If lambda is equal to 1, then the probability that a box has 0 in it will be 1 to the power 0, e to the minus 1 over 0 factorial, which is just 1. So that's just e to the minus 1. So it's probability 1 over e that the box will be empty. Then you'll find out it's also probability 1 over e that it will contain 1. And if you want to see that it contains 2, then you say it's lambda squared, e to the minus lambda, over 2 factorial. So that's actually e lambda uh, squared. If lambda is 1, then it's just 1 squared is 1. e to the minus lambda is e to the minus 1. And k is now 2, so it'll be e to the minus 1 over 2. So that's why the height of this is exactly the half the height of that. And so you can just calculate these all once you've got the formula. OK. Now, there are other distributions that are a little more interesting than this. And that is, um, in this process, what happens if there's not random placement of balls into boxes? So random placement of balls into boxes means that the individuals who have the balls are searching around at random. And they see a box, they'll put something in, or they won't put something in. And then they search again, and they see another box. So the searching behavior is at random, and the boxes just turn up or don't turn up at random. But what happens if there's a bunch of boxes sitting on top of a leaf over here, and then there's another bunch of boxes sitting under some leaves over here? If these parasitoids are searching at random, but the boxes are not distributed at random, some boxes are more likely to be found than others. So you get clusters of boxes that are more likely to be find, found than other clusters. So you, so you kind of get an aggregation. So it's almost like some boxes, if they've already got an egg in, are more likely to have an egg, a second egg. And other boxes, if they're empty, they're more likely to remain empty. So the boxes that are harder to find are more likely to remain empty if they're currently empty. And the boxes that are easy to find are more likely to have something in and also more likely to be found again. So in this case, you get contagious distributions. And one such contagious distribution is called the negative binomial distribution. Um, and again, there's formulas for calculating. There are two parameters in this case. The one parameter is um, r, and the other parameter is k. Um, and the mean of this distribution is given by p times r over 1 minus, so sorry, this is, this is r and p, not r and k. But sometimes in the literature they'll call it r and k instead of r and p. But k got r and p. The mean of this distribution is equal to p times r over 1 minus p. Um, but there are two parameters. And in this case, you can see that for different values of r, the distribution looks different. But as the value of um, p goes up, so p is kind of a, a parameter that uh, tells you about how contagious the distribution is. And so you can play around with these two parameters. And um, the one parameter, as it goes to infinity, will approach the Poisson distribution, the parameter p. And the other parameter will um, be used to control the mean number. Anyway, the point is not that um, all you have to remember is how to calculate, in this case, the proportion of, of boxes that don't have any eggs in them. And so why is that proportion important? Let's go back to the lecture. So if, if we look at host parasite models, we can make the assumption that any larva that has been attacked by one or more individuals is now parasitized and is going to produce one new parasitoid. So what's going to happen is this larva has got one or more eggs in it. Only one of these eggs will develop, and each larva will give rise to a new parasitoid that emerges out of it. However, only boxes that are empty, so that's only parasitoids that have not been attacked, can they go on to make a new adult of the same species. So we're interested in the proportion of boxes that are empty or the proportion of hosts that have not been attacked. So you have two quantities here. You have to calculate the proportion of hosts that are attacked and the proportion of hosts that are not attacked. The life history is such that where is this? So here are hosts. That, this one is just useless. OK, so here you have two hosts. This one's attacked. This one's not attacked. So this one will lead to a new host, and this one will lead to a new parasitoid. OK, so that's the basic idea behind this model, is that 
you have a certain number of parasitoids and you have a certain number of hosts. You have a certain number of parasitoids per host, uh, and each parasitoid can lay a certain number of eggs. And so you kind of get the average number of eggs that can be laid and the average number of hosts or well, number of hosts that can be attacked. And what you're interested in is in the proportion that are not attacked will give, lead, give rise to new hosts, and the proportion that are attacked will give rise to new parasitoids. So let's formalize this idea with a model. Okay. Yeah. It can be attacked again, but we're making the assumption that each host that's attacked will give rise to one new parasitoid. And that assumption, as I mentioned, is that the first parasitoid egg in is the winner. Now, this is not the case always, but this is for well, this model. So we're going to make a number of simplifications about, the, about our model here. So the first one is that we're going to have synchronized generations. Now, if you look at agricultural pests, typically they'll be the start of the season, um, and uh, let's say we have an agricultural pest that attacks a plant, like a corn earworm or whatever, a moth or a butterfly that will attack a plant. The season starts, and let's say the adult butterflies overwinter as adults. They sit somewhere, and they say, okay, we've got to make it through the winter. A certain number of them make it through the winter. Now the plant starts to grow, and they go in search of plants that they can attack. And they're interested in the little flowers and uh, the, the corn when it's young and growing, and they will lay one or more eggs on um, an ear of corn. So you have kind of a seasonal signal. Now there's the idea of univoltine and multivoltine populations, or univoltine and multivoltine. In temperate areas, insects are very often, they may have one generation per season. Um, this is not the case for aphids, for example, where they pump out lots of generations per season. Or if you go to the tropics where there isn't a strong uh, uh, temperature signal, which is important for insect development, there may be um, a wet season and a dry season, and it may make some difference. But typically, in temperate areas, you'll get these synchronized generations. You get a generation of pests, one generation each season. Sometimes, in places that are very hot, you might get two generations. But let's just think of one generation. And so the first assumption we make is that the host population has a discrete semoparous life history. So semoparous is when individuals breed once and then die. So they don't have lots of young. So there are some fish species like salmon that breed once every four years. Uh, Pacific salmon typically do that. But there are also insects. They go through this development. You have the adult stage. The adults will mate and breed and then die. And so you can have these discrete generations that are very much linked to the seasonal signal. So what happens is we're going to assume, to keep the model simple, that there's this generation that is synchronized. All, all insects are going through a stage where early in the season the eggs will be laid, then the adults will die, then the eggs will develop. Some of, the, some of the eggs will be attacked, some will be eaten, some will die, but a certain proportion of them make it and develop into new adults. But before they develop into new adults, they go through a larval stage, typically in a pupil stage, and then they emerge as new adults. And then when they emerge as new adults, they typically that's the end of the season. It's like the monarch butterfly will migrate and then come back at the start of the new season. Do you have a question? So we, we are going to make that assumption. We haven't yet, but that's where we're heading, yeah. So what we're saying first is that the host population has these synchronized generations that are synchronized. Uh, typically, the signal to synchronize them is the seasonal signal. Then we come in and say, okay, we have a parasitoid that has the same generation cycle as its host, because what it does is the parasitoid also has some adults that maybe overwintered and lived in some shrubs and bushes or whatever, um, or had to find a way to survive the winter. And then at the start of the season, when uh, the, the hosts have laid their eggs and the eggs start to develop, they come along and they search out either the egg stage or the larval stage or the pupil stage, depending what kind of parasitoid they are. So some attack, as I said, some attack the egg stage, some attack the larval stage, but typically let's say the larval stage. And they're searching around and they lay their eggs, and then what they do is they develop and they retard the development of the host. Uh, so within inside the host, there's this other little organism developing. Everybody seen the movie of the, what was the movie called with human parasites and parasitoids? Huh? Alien, right. Yeah, so that's the theme of the alien movie is the human parasitoid from, so that's exactly the same story, except they haven't got synchronized generations. So now we're at this stage where somewhere in mid-season, this individual is now going to pupate and become an adult host, and this individual will eventually die, but it's kept alive as a food resource for the parasite and parasitoid inside it. Okay, so that's the second assumption, the parasite, so I could say paras some people just call them parasites. Uh, so there's this fancy name, parasitoid. When you say parasitoid, you only mean parasitoids. When you say parasite, it could be parasitoids, it could be pathogens, it could be bacteria, it could be fungus, it could be anything. So this should be the parasite population is essentially solitary. So when we say the parasitoids are solitary, what we mean is that one attacked host produces one parasite. There are situations where multiple eggs can be laid and all the eggs can survive. And this is an alternative life history that happens. It's complicated, but it's not the most typical. The most typical is that we have these solitary parasitoids. And they search for hosts essentially in a, ra in a random way. So the Poisson distribution turns out to be a good model for how many hosts will be attacked. But if there's some kind of aggregation, then we'll use a negative binomial model. Now, this ignores the fact that host, that the parasitoid is a sophisticated organism and that they actually don't search at random. How do you think a parasitoid finds a host? If you were a parasitoid and you were flying around a tiny little thing, how would you find your host? How do you think they find them? Yeah, but how would they find it? What kind of, uh, would, they, would they listen for it? Would they look for it? Or would they try to smell it? I don't know. Whatever, whatever works. Yeah. So it turns out that what works best are actually chemical cues. So they use chemical. So firstly, if you're a parasitoid and you're looking for a corn earworm, 
then you've got to, what you do is you search for corn. Now that's a big signal. There's a cornfield out there, and growing corn smells like growing corn to a parasitoid. To humans, I don't know what it smells like, but they can find that. And then when they come in there, they start searching around, and they have search strategies. And then when they get very close, they also may be using chemical cues, and there may be some visual cues involved, but it's more likely chemical cues. Then they can come to the host, and they can touch the host. And uh, insects typically smell with antennae. So they'll come, and they'll take the antennae, and they'll sort of put it on the host and say, okay, this is a suitable victim for me. But they may also be able to tell that another parasitoid was there, because the other parasitoid would have left its olfactory footprint on the host and handling it. So they're not so stupid. But our models assume that they are relatively stupid and that they are likely not to be able to tell that a host was attacked. So that's another thing where the model may not work so well. So we're making the assumption that these parasitoids, when they find a host, will attack it, and that this attack rate is either given by a Poisson distribution, or if there's some aggregation, then it will be a, bi a, a negative binomial distribution. But there are also two complications. The rate at which parasitoids find hosts may be in proportion to uh, the number of hosts around. So for example, if you're a parasitoid and there are lots of hosts, then in any unit of time, an hour, you're going to find hosts in proportion to their density. So if there are lots of hosts, maybe you'll find 20. And if they're half the density of hosts, maybe you'll only find 10. In that case, what we say is the parasitoid is search limited. So you're limited by your ability to fly around and look. And the greater the density of hosts, the more rapidly you can find them. There's also something called a handling time. So if you find a host, you can't lay an egg instantaneously on it. You have to come down and you have to search around for a good place to lay an egg and it takes a certain amount of time to lay an egg. So you might only be able to lay uh, two or three eggs an hour, whatever. So you're also limited by uh, the handling time. But the main limitations are, are you limited by your search, which is how rapidly can you search an area? Or are you limited by the number of eggs you have? For example, if you have 10 eggs and there are lots of hosts, after a short period of time, you run out of eggs and you're finished. So there are two kinds of parasitoids. There's some that are search limited, and every time they find a host, they've got an egg to lay. So these are ones that are likely to have lots of eggs. And uh, so they're likely to make smaller eggs. And if, you've got a, and if you make a smaller egg, then your larva starts out smaller and it's going to be less competitive if somebody else comes and lays a slightly bigger egg and has a bigger larvae and then cannot compete you. So there's all these complications that the model isn't going to take into account in too much detail. So you can either be search limited or egg limited or a combination of both. And then we talked about this first in wins. So hosts cannot distinguish the attack from non-attack, sorry, um, parasitoids cannot distinguish attack from non-attack hosts and the first egg in wins. So now in order to make a model, you begin by let the number of hosts or let the number of parasitoids be given by a variable. And so we use the variables, in this case, n and p. I wonder if there's black over here. Blue. Okay. So n at time t and p of time t. This is the number of hosts in generation t, and this is the number of, ho uh, of parasitoids in generation t. OK, so you've got n of t and p of t. Now you have this thing called an escape function, f, n, and p. This function will tell us that if you've got a certain number of hosts and a certain number of parasitoids searching, then a certain proportion of the hosts will escape attack. So this is called the escape function. So this escape function is going to be determined by using either Poisson distribution or the negative binomial. And then you also have this concept of E or epsilon. I used to prefer chalk because chalk actually writes. Epsilon is the encounter rate. So if you have a certain um, number of parasitoids searching and a certain number of hosts available, how often will a parasite encounter a host in a single unit of time? And then the basic model is that n at t plus 1, this doesn't work, n at t plus 1. Now we had this model that said, if you remember, n at t plus 1 uh, is equal to, and instead of r, I'm going to use lambda. So this would just be exponential growth. So remember, in our earlier models, we called lambda r. But in most of the literature where they develop these models, they use lambda, not r. So if there were no parasitoids attacking the population, it would grow exponentially like this. And we've seen this model. But now, what happens is only the one